The right to vote is the primary right by which other rights are protected. Thomas Paine. The nasty little secret of American democracy, and we're not supposed to talk about this, is that not all the ballots get counted. The poll workers watched a hundred and some people go in specifically to that booth and vote. At the end of the day, when that tape came out, one person had voted, according to the machine. People, they should be talking about this, not from the standpoint of you're liberal and you're conservative and you know which side of the fence are you on. The issue is, if it was tainted once, it could be tainted again. It is critical that all qualified voters are able to vote and that all votes are counted as cast. There's growing evidence that eligible citizens are being denied the right to vote and that votes, when cast, may be lost or miscounted or even deleted. Until recently, most Americans have assumed that our elections are basically honest. But with each election, more and more people are reporting incidents of voter suppression and irregular tallies. At first, machine problems were dismissed as glitches, and difficulties faced by voters were simply the result of poor planning and poll worker error. But as anomalies continued to be uncovered, people began to realize that voting problems, which had seemed in the past to affect only a few states, could be happening nationwide. One of the few mainstream venues exploring controversial election issues has been Comedy Central. What an honor. Thank, thank you for coming on. Now, you have made quite a stir, sir, with this article of yours in Rolling Stone. You say, you ask with the title of this article, did Bush steal the 2004 election? I'll bite. <laughs> did he? My vote? answer's no, but then the interview's over. Now, in a representative democracy, you want everybody to vote, and you want the majority of voters to try to select the president. OK, let me ask you something. Which was easier, for uh, Bush to steal Ohio in 2004 or for your uncle to steal Illinois in 1960? <laughs> Let me say something. Uh, you can say anything you want. OK. Anybody who steals an election or tries to steal one is wrong, no mm -hmm. matter who it is. American elections have never been administered by saints and angels. All parties historically have stuffed ballot boxes, suppressed votes. Look at the history of the voting rights movement in the South. As recently as the 1960s, people died to get access to the ballot. American elections have been two-fisted political brawls. When Kennedy beat Nixon in 1960, there was a lot of talk that in Chicago the ballots had been rigged. There's never been any question but that when an election is at hand, a true believer will do what he or she thinks is necessary. How do we know if an election is fair? One way is to recount paper ballots by hand, or at least audit a given percentage of them. Another way is to use polls and compare the results with the final tallies. In pre-election polls, people are asked how they intend to vote, and in exit polls, how they just voted. The largest gap ever reported in a U.S. presidential election between exit polls based on first-person reports and the official vote tally was in 2004.
2004 election was very problematical. And it wasn't just in one state or, or one city or one location. It was a national phenomenon. And state after state, exit polls showed totally different outcome than vote counts. It's such an enormous disparity between exit polls, which have always been reliable, and vote count. And instead of coming up with some you know, real hard look at this. They just assumed that the exit polls were discredited. But why not the vote count? This is an issue that shouldn't be partisan. This is a people's issue. This is not Republican or Democrat. Everybody at least says they want fair elections. from our last presidential election, it's that democracy is far too important to rely on an outdated, arrow-prone system like punch card ballots. So, as we gear up for the 2004 vote, many communities have moved on to electronic voting, a far more high-tech, <laughs> error-prone system. As new electronic voting machines were being installed across the country, the parties mounted intensive registration and get out the vote drives. The bloodhounds of democracy. It is to those bloodhounds and all of the campaign staffers and speechwriters, advance teams, door knockers, phone bankers, and organizers on both sides that I'd like to send a warm and enthusiastic thank you. You have devoted your time and energy, not just to your candidate and your party, but to your country. So for me, a tip of the hat. It's one of the uh, fabulous things about this campaign has been the number of volunteers. We have 1.2 million volunteers out. We have 7.5 million people who are e-activists, voluntarily, without being paid, contacting their friends, saying, remember to vote. I and other people went out and we registered voters. Sometimes you just had to beg people. You had to stand there for a half hour and convince them that voting was important. Door to door, every, every day or every weekend we were out there. There was always somebody who made sure everybody in their house was registered. Once you cast that vote, you're saying, I'm a part of this. It was just like this moment of connecting with people, of just a very fundamental job of being a citizen is voting. And we were helping people to do that. The Votes 2004. On the calendar, and it is election day, the polls open in this particular location. A huge number of new voters registered all across the state, north, south, east, and west. And on election day, we get reports about the many people that were going out to vote and everybody began to become stakeholders. The thing that I've been most impressed with all day is the number of young people that are coming out to vote. I mean, from 18 to 22, it's phenomenal how they are coming out in record numbers. With the caveat, again, that it is early, it appears this election, despite extraordinarily heavy turnout, is going very smoothly. As you pointed out, Jack says lots of people emailing him saying, they're in and out in 10 minutes. And that's good. I passed a couple polling places. It was raining, it was cold. And I saw something I'd never seen. I saw long lines of people around the corner waiting to go vote. And I have been talking to Democrats and Republicans all day. Even though they were predicting record turnout, I think they're really stunned by the lines they're seeing. More than 120 million registered voters participated in the 2004 general election, the highest number to have ever voted in an election in the United States rivaling a modern benchmark that was set four decades ago. But along with the crowd, there have been some complaints from Pennsylvania to Florida and even across the country. It was a wonderful feeling until we found that um, there was something wrong, something was going on that was different.
And when I got to the polls, it, I was out in the rain because the line was all the way out in the building. Now, they vote in the basement, <laughs> you know, so the line went all the way up the steps, all the way through the building and all the way outside. I was hoping to get in and get out, you know, as I've been voting for 35 years and I've never had to wait in line, you know, can go before I go to work, work on time. Well, that didn't happen this year. If you wanted to vote, you had to stand in line. And some people made sacrifices and they got out of line and I saw people never come back to vote. There is no reason, absolutely no reason why people should have to wait three hours, four hours, two hours, whatever they had to wait. When I waited five minutes in my own precinct to vote, it was outrageous. In, in some of the African-American communities, mm -hmm. um, there were lines that were 11 hours long. On average, black people had to wait three and a half hours to vote, whereas white suburban residents had to wait less than 18 minutes. There was some volunteers there from various groups saying this woman can't vote, they won't let her vote. She just fainted. She said she'd been waiting two and a half hours. The, the people under said, you know, she's sick, she's on chemotherapy. She was entitled to be moved to the front of the line. And I was told by the judge, no, I'm not gonna do it. I'm the presiding judge here. All I remember is going outside to the woman was sitting down outside the school and saying, they won't let you vote, they won't move you up. And she said, I did my best. In some communities, the new voting machines speeded up the voting process. In others, there were simply not enough working machines. I got a call from a few of my fellow uh, volunteers at Kenyon, and they said, Matt, you've got to get out here. It's turned crazy. Go. Got pizza coming in. The first time I got there, they said four hours, and then it turned into six hours, eight and a half hours, nine and a half hours. Certainly, that's not an isolated case. In the Ohio precinct where Kenyon College students voted, some students waited more than 12 hours. Two machines served 1,300 registered voters. Each machine was expected to handle at least 600 people, more than three times the recommended federal guidelines. We had one precinct where there were three machines. One of them never worked. And this was from 9 o'clock in the morning. We made calls to the Board of Elections all day. And I was on the phone with the Board of Elections screaming at that point, we need another machine, we need something. Because at that point, other polling places were closed. There was no reason they couldn't bring in another machine. We, we had a lot of calls from voters upset because, you know, again, two precincts, why does this one have more machines than I do? Well, it was based on registration and some of those other estimates that we used. And the bottom line was there were not enough voting machines. Did the Board of Elections do this on purpose? Did he manipulate the distribution of voting machines? The Republican Party denies it. Even the Democrats, some of them say, no, well, it was just accidental. People cannot wait for a day to vote. Our role is to provide access to the right to vote. We are the gatekeepers of democracy. And if we do not provide enough equipment for the voters to access this process, then in fact, we are suppressing their votes. I hope that those people that, uh, that look like this is the first time they ever stepped in a voting booth that looked like they had to bring their three kids with them. That I hope that this experience does not make them say the next time, we don't, we don't make a difference, that we can't change anything. I, that, that we sold them this, that it was important to do this. Some of the long lines were caused by machine shortages. Others were due to machine failures. Thousands of voters reported machine malfunctions in 42 states. Machine problems included touchscreens going blank, 
vote switching from one candidate to another, machine breakdowns, and inaccurate totals. Some computer screens froze, causing delays as technicians tried to fix them. The technology that promised to make voting faster and more accurate was turning out to be unreliable. And, uh, it seems to me that these electronic voting machines still have a few kinks. How concerned do you think we should be? Well, John, most of these voting machines run on the same rock-solid Windows platform that never crashes at your home or office. <laughs> it's an exciting moment, John. <laughs> we have finally arrived at a golden age of technology, a halcyon era in which... <laughs> in which... Ed, Ed. Sorry, hold, hold on, John, the teleprompter crashed. <laughs> Just give it a second, it's gonna reboot. One serious touchscreen malfunction was vote switching. Voters would select one candidate and their vote would switch on the screen to someone else. Vote switching in Florida was concentrated in certain counties. In my area, in Palm Beach and Broward counties on election day, remarkably, every complaint was never anybody who intended to vote for George Bush, but who couldn't. People were indignant or near tears because they had pressed carry when they were trying to vote, and they, the machine itself lit up and said, Bush. Again, the good news, problems in Florida virtually non-existent, just small glitches here and there. Mainstream news neglected to mention certain difficulties faced by voters, like vote switching. Though there was little TV or radio coverage, election hotlines were getting reports of vote switching from at least 13 states. Mahoning County, Ohio, was one place where votes were switching on multiple machines throughout the day. Well, I voted for Kerry, and when I got to the final page, on this computer screen to say who my final votes were for, it came up Bush. I pushed the square for John Kerry, and I almost went on to the next page before I realized that it was lighting up George Bush. I pushed my vote for John Kerry. Immediately, the vote jumps up and lights up the name of George Bush. Well, I screamed. There was chaos when people were coming out and saying their votes didn't register right. They were angry. I'm sorry, uh, no, what it says is, how, how are you reconciling the discrepancy? And right away, one of the aides ran over to me. And she says, oh, push it again. That's been happening a lot. As I was leaving, there were people that were asking the poll workers to help them because the same thing had happened to them. And I thought to myself, you're not real computer literate. Did you push the wrong button? Then when I got out into my car, I was thinking, no, something happened to me. Something happened to me. That, that machine is not right. A few months after the election, we had a gathering here at the church. We met in the church basement. And one of the things that we did is just ask how many people know someone not just a story, but know someone whose vote switched. And just in that room of 40 people, we knew 50. All the concerns going into the election about the e-voting machines, the electronic voting, uh, not having a paper trail, we're not really recording any problems or significant problems. Most newscasters continued to ignore reports of vote switching, while concerned activists used the internet to bring attention to the issue. John Kerry. Hello, John Kerry. John, I mean, next. Are you sure? Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm really, really sure. You don't want to not vote for John Kerry. No. John Kerry. Oh, come on. John Kerry. 
John Kerry. Okay, maybe I want to vote for George Bush. John Kerry! Ah. Uh, come here, you little jerk, John Kerry! Come here, you little jerk! What? No! In more than 90% of vote switching reports, votes cast for John Kerry switched on the screen to George Bush. There should be an expectation that the anomalies would fall kind of 50-50. Some would support one candidate, some would support the other candidate. They didn't seem to fall both ways. It's simply impossible to validate what happens inside certain electronic voting and counting machines. So one of, one of the ways of uh, checking what's actually happening in this sort of black box vote counting system where it's sort of faith-based voting and you don't know really what's happening would be exit polling. The person comes out of the, out of the poll and they, there's somebody there and they say, uh, could we interview you? Mm -hmm. And uh, they, what they do is they give them a ballot, basically, and they fill it in. Exit polls are powerful when done right because they tell us the demographics of voting, the attitudes of voting. That's the stuff that we really come to depend on. For the 2004 election, a consortium of broadcast networks hired a polling firm, Edison Mitofsky. Interviewers were stationed at 1,480 randomly selected voting sites across the country to gather information. There are safeguards in place now. We will be much more careful, we know, as we go throughout the evening tonight, in part because the software is better, the computers are better, and also the analysis will be better. In spite of Edison Mitofsky's effort to withhold results until the polls closed, during the day, early exit poll data was leaked to the public and published on the internet. The leaked data revealed that in critical states, sometimes called battleground or swing states, Kerry was ahead in the exit polls in 10 of the 12 swing states. Every time there were percentages put up there, Kerry was definitely ahead and had the momentum. It was like, he's gonna win. That we, the states we can project for Illinois, uh, John Kerry wins that state as expected. He wins Connecticut as well as expected. The District of Columbia, there was never any doubt there. New Jersey, a big win for John Kerry. According to the Washington Post, early evening exit polls pointed to a decisive win for Kerry. Those exit polls showed Kerry holding a lead in states that totaled 309 electoral votes with Bush's tally totaling 174. After voting sites closed, exit polls being released on the internet showed Kerry ahead, as he had been earlier in the day. During the evening, a discrepancy appeared between the exit polls and the official tallies. The official tally, as it was being reported by the broadcast media, showed Bush running much stronger than he had been doing in the exit polls. Those exit polls showing a carry win in Florida, those exit polls showing perhaps a carry win in Ohio, and in several other states that have already been called, a carry margin very different from what the actual results are showing. So what the Bush campaign believes now is that the exit polls were flawed. When there's a difference between exit poll data and the vote count, the exit poll company mathematically adjusts the poll numbers to match the official tally. Between 10.30 and 11 p.m., Edison Mitofsky's computer server had gone down, and the exit poll numbers remained unadjusted for several hours. As a result of this temporary unintended freeze, election observers were able to download the unadjusted exit poll numbers, showing Kerry still in the lead went on the CNN website, and lo and behold, there were all these uh, exit polls uh, broken down in all sorts of various demographic ways. And I set about um, downloading them. So we're looking at the exit polls, and the exit polls clearly showed that uh, John Kerry carried Ohio, which was enough to give him an election, and Iowa, and Nevada, and New Mexico. 
I've been on the phone to some uh, Republicans in Ohio, and they're very pessimistic. 20 minutes now, 25 minutes after the polls closed, African Americans were still waiting in line in predominantly black precincts. Looking at the returns, they think it's going to be very tough for Bush, to President Bush, to carry Ohio. They know they need Ohio. That is now the central focus for the rest of this night, or at least the next few hours. Until 12.21 a.m., Kerry was still leading, according to the exit polls. The first indication that the apparent Democratic victory might not happen as projected had come around midnight when ABC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News all called Florida for Bush. And then something happened where the next time it was put on the screen, the percentages and the numbers, it was exactly flipped. In the early morning hours, when the backup server reconnected and exit poll adjustments resumed, observers watched a dramatic shift. From that point on, exit polls now mirrored the vote count and projected George Bush as the winner. Bush took the lead in the national popular vote as Kerry's projected wins in key states were disappearing. If you were to look on the internet any time after roughly 1 a.m., you would see exit poll results, which essentially conformed to the vote count. The results that got pulled off the web and pulled away from the public eye that I was able to download and print out showed a discrepancy in the popular vote um, that was very, very significant. Very close race. Could still go either way. What's the mood there? Confident, John. The president is thrilled he will be leading the country for the next few years. It's a little early to say he will be. The numbers really aren't in yet. The numbers. John. This is not a man who is going to let the numbers stand in the way of moving America forward. There's also a, a growing dissatisfaction, even anger, with us uh, in the media. And it seems as if he wants the uh, stamp of legitimacy. All these states are coming in red, blue, red, blue, red, red, blue, blue. And now it's just Ohio. We're waiting on Ohio. What we're going to give you is a solid tabulation when we give it to you if it takes two hours two days or two weeks the result that we give you will be a good result that the voters of the state of ohio can have confidence in at about um, 2 a.m msnbc called the vote and we were dumbfounded. We knew that there were people still voting, that they were still online to vote, that there were nine to 15 hour waits that were still happening, and they were calling the vote. And I couldn't believe this. I was shocked. Among the last tallies added to Ohio's totals were 92,000 votes from Warren County. According to the Cincinnati Inquirer, while those votes were being counted, the media and other observers were locked out of the county administration building. The Inquirer, which is a respected local paper with a conservative perspective, reported that the lockout was in response to an alleged terror threat. During the week following the election, after doing their own investigation, the Inquirer reported that both Homeland Security and the FBI denied that they had issued that warning. Votes from Warren County were among those which gave George Bush his last-minute, unanticipated margin of victory in Ohio. How did hundreds and hundreds of thousands of votes shift, not in a progressive, incremental way, but in this almost complete, sudden, violent reversal? Remember, at the time these shifts are occurring, the people in lines are overwhelmingly uh, African-American citizens and college students at liberal campuses. If anything, the shift should be going in the other direction. In the early morning hours, reporters were closely monitoring vote totals in the last states to be called, including New Mexico. 
Judy Woodruff, help our viewers understand why we're now going back from the too close to call green column to the white column in which we don't have enough information yet to make any projection. Well, we're trying to figure all this out right now, Wolf. Uh, apparently what has happened is that the Associated Press, they were feeding numbers into us and then suddenly those numbers changed. Uh, in other words, there was about, a, I'm told, a two to 6,000 vote margin between President Bush's uh, position and John Kerry's position. And then that margin grew suddenly to an 11,000 vote margin. And because of that, we now want to make sure, we, first of all, we want to find out what happened. What I'm telling you is that uh, the numbers changed and sometimes these things happen. People in the room got quiet. It was funny because we were all observing this on our own, but, as, but collectively, we knew something wasn't right. They're in Karl Rove's office, several senior staffers, and they're calling into the states. They're clicking up on these counties, looking at the results come in. And the president himself popped in a short time ago and said, what's the holdup? The motorcade is on the other side of the White House. It is gassed up and ready to go. All right, let's get some numbers for you. As you can see, President Bush right now has 51 percent of the vote. Uh, Senator John Kerry has 48 percent. If he hangs on too long without conceding beyond the point where it seems reasonable and where the, the media, for example, are calling the election, uh, then he'll then he'll look like uh, like a sore loser. Hello, I'm Wolf Blitzer in New York. Twelve full hours after the last poll closings of election 2004. There's now an undisputed winner. The Democratic candidate for president, John F. Kerry, has conceded the race in a phone call to the Republican incumbent, President George W. Bush. Earlier today, uh, I spoke to President Bush and I offered him and Laura our congratulations on their victory. I think today there is more sadness than there is anger. They're just feeling pretty sad about the whole thing because, as Jeff said, they've, and we've watched them, they have given their all. I didn't anticipate this. I don't think any of us did. Uh, the, the, we looked at the polls over the last few weeks. Conventional wisdom was the president gets 48, 49 percent in the final polls. He's not going to get much more than that, maybe 1 percent more right. in the actual election. He got way over that. And I think that left everyone sort of puzzled. What the heck happened? And the anger of the Republicans uh, feeling that the press coverage in the early afternoon had been shaped by the exit polls, not that anybody actually talked about them, but that really? everybody had it in their mind. I think there's going to be a lot of hell to pay uh, after all this alleged reform that these numbers were wrong. David Brooks, uh, how do you, what do you think's happened on the de exit polls? Do you have a theory? I know nobody knows but why they're so, the exit polls are so wrong. We all rely on this stuff not only for predicting, but for trying to figure out what the electorate looks like. I have yet to hear a theory of the case, in effect, for what happened, why it really happened. We can never sweep under the rug disturbing questions, either because we don't want to face them or because we think it may advantage one political party and disadvantage another. Once that starts, the truth recedes even more. If the Republicans, in fact, stole this election, the Democrats were willing accomplices by sitting by and letting it happen and not challenging it. I mean, there is a sort of unspoken situation here where the Democrats don't want to raise these issues. When Senator Bob Hagan saw his vote switch from John Kerry to George Bush, he tried to report what had happened to Democratic headquarters. I touched uh, John Kerry, and as I touched it, it immediately went to Bush. I called the Kerry campaign, and uh, I said, I really think that this is a serious problem. We need to talk about this. You know, we should get it out. The press would be uh, interested in this. But the Kerry campaign said, leave it alone. 
Don't talk about it. It's not something we want to get out. For decades, Senator Hagan's district in Mahoning County had been a hub of political controversy involving both major parties. When I was on the Board of Elections in the 80s, there was a Democrat who was Secretary of State, and he made outrageous rulings that helped the Democrats uh, win elections in, in Ohio. That's the kind of system that we have, and, if, and unless people want to change that, that's the kind of system we're going to have. Both parties toy with the vote when they have the opportunity, but at the moment, the sophisticated methods and the big money which drives those sophisticated methods using massive computers, massive mailings, databases, that is right now in the control of the Republican Party. Even though the Republicans seem to control the voting technology and the corporations that, that count the votes, uh, the Democrats have not exhibited a keen interest in uh, addressing the situation. If the Democrats won't support the Constitution and the Republicans will, then I'll stand with Republicans. If uh, Republicans don't defend the Constitution and Democrats will, then I'll stand with the Democrats. And the great fear is that we'll reach a point where neither party will defend the Constitution. Exit polls developed in the late 1960s uh, for years and years were regarded as very accurate and reliable indicators of how an election would turn out. Exit polls in recent years have become increasingly inaccurate. Exit polls, before they were adjusted, had pointed toward a Kerry victory. The official vote tally reflected a Bush victory. A 3% decrease for Kerry and a 3% increase for Bush equals a 6% discrepancy in the margin of victory. The margin of error is the maximum percentage one can reasonably expect a poll to differ from the actual results. When you're dealing with statistics, you never get certainty. A discrepancy of 6% is so far outside the margin of error of that poll that statisticians across the board will give you general agreement that it could not occur as a matter of chance or statistical aberration. Exit polls were a focus of concern at meetings about election problems hosted by Representative John Conyers. Today, we at Zogby International, too, have questions of our own many of which center on early exit polling results that were uncharacteristically inaccurate in several battleground states. This election has produced unprecedented levels of suspicion regarding its outcome. There has been very little willingness to cooperate by those who hold the information, which would be basically the consortium of major media outlets. They claim proprietary rights to all this data. That was the only checks and balances we had with these electronic voting machines. The electronic voting machines have no audit trail. They can't be recounted. We have to have some backup. The man behind the exit polls, Warren Matowski, very respected in this business, is one of the key people who wrote the rules of ethics that are right here in my drawer. One of those rules is transparency. I've talked to Warren Matowski. And he said to me, well, it's proprietary data. In spite of repeated requests, Edison Matofsky refused to release the raw data to researchers and colleagues. It's not proprietary data at all. And one of the difficulties I have is that lay it all out on the table. Let's see what happened. Only data that we have is the data that's in the Matofsky Edison report. And that's a summarized data. When you have the raw data, you have a lot more opportunity to do analysis. And the fact that we don't have that says a whole lot. It is very much a reason why we should investigate this election. After the election, statisticians continued to analyze data to see if there were patterns to the widespread exit poll discrepancies. 
In the battleground or swing states, according to the exit polls, Kerry was ahead in 10 of the 12 states. The final tallies showed Kerry taking just five of the 10 states in which he had been ahead. When the final tallies were compared with figures before the exit polls had been adjusted, researchers noted that in 11 of the 12 states, regardless of the winner, there was a red shift away from exit poll results towards George Bush. The polls now no longer match the results on election day on the machines. And that is very disquieting to me because there's got to be a reason for that. I want to know why. Stories about irregularities with the 2004 election did begin to appear on the internet, on progressive TV shows, and in local papers. But mainstream networks and national newspaper chains continued to remain silent. Frankly, I put off writing about the election because like everybody else in the country, if there's a real problem, why isn't it in the newspapers? Nobody had picked up any stories. Um, the only times we'd seen something were a couple articles in the New York Times saying loonies on the internet say that you know votes had been switched, something like that. We were furious. I can see the decline in journalism uh, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal, especially on the editorial page. And you would have expected the Wall Street Journal to see an opportunity in a story such as the disparity between the exit polls and the vote count that was being neglected by the so-called uh, mainstream or corporate media. The investigations of 2004 and the vote loss, the ballots that were never counted. We reported this all over the planet and we could not get this on US TV for anything. We tried, believe me, we tried, and it was simply not permitted. How do you counter this e enormous force, the incredible amount of money and resources that they have? The people became the fourth estate. It was the folks on the internet who found uh, a great number of the irregularities that Lord only knows if they would have been discovered at all if it hadn't been for these, uh, I call them this, this army of citizen patriots who were looking at these things, trying to figure it out. Now, that said, there's only so much that bloggers and folks on the internet can actually do. We need the mainstream media to get down there, to get on the ground, to talk to officials who won't talk to us, who won't call me back, but who might call the New York Times back, and to find out what actually happened. I remember in this country we used to call spin lying. Now we call it spin and we study it and we admire it. How to put out a line of bull and have it fly for more than 24 hours. That's the ultimate power in a, in a political realm, is, is controlling perceptions. People often wonder if there has been an evaluation of what actually happened in 2004 and uh, any kind of post-mortem uh, forensic analysis of the machines. And not only hasn't there been one, but there couldn't be one. These machines are fully electronic. If there's any code in the machines by design that would change votes from one candidate to another, that code could erase itself. Uh, there would be no trace. Well, Bob, if you could walk us through how this electronic voting works, if, oh, if you could. Okay, John. After the voter has made his, or from what I understand, in some states, her on-screen selection, <laughs> the information is converted from the complex English language, such as this, to this simple binary code. This server processes the information and tells you who won. But how do you know that the server is correct? It is possible to manipulate votes on a very massive scale with a low probability of detection. And the reason uh, that's true now is a result of the advance of technology. One of the things that we've done in penetration tests is come in and attach a wireless access point behind a copier somewhere and then sit out in the parking lot uh, and access network resources from outdoors. 
I changed, I think, 13,000 votes with a, a sample uh, database taken from an old election. Um, and in my speed hacking the vote, uh, I changed something like 1.6 million votes um, just to show that it could be done. There's really no limit to the number of votes you can change. A major study released in 2006 concluded that all commonly used voting systems are susceptible to tampering. The Brennan Report, compiled by a panel of computer and election experts, plainly states the threat analysis shows that machines with wireless components are particularly vulnerable to software attack programs and other attacks. Machines record our votes, machines tally our votes, and we are, of course, told to trust the machines. In spite of official assurances of accuracy and security, voters find it difficult to trust machines when they can actually see their vote switch from one candidate to another. People tried to, to vote for Kerry and it flipped to Bush. So people ask me, is that possible? Would it be possible to program something like that? Well, absolutely. Vote switching not only overwhelmingly occurred in multiple jurisdictions, but also occurred on equipment programmed by different vendors. Something that favors one candidate that occurs all over the country and spans across equipment from multiple vendors is no simple accident. We have this stampede to embrace these machines. It ought to be the most critically important technology that exists in this country is the technology that we use to decide who will be our next leader, and it's junk. The machines themselves are a focus of concern, which leads to the question, who controls the software that tells the machines what to do? Mr. Curtis, would you please state your full name for the record? My uh, name is Clinton Eugene Curtis. In December 2004, a group of Congress members met to gather information about the technology used in the November election. One witness was Clint Curtis, a computer programmer, who testified about being asked to create vote-switching software. Mr. Curtis, are there programs that can be used to secretly fix elections? Yes. How do you know that to be the case? Because in October of 2000, I wrote a prototype for Congressman Tom Feeney. It would rig an election? It would flip the vote 51-49. And he was very specific on what he wanted. He wanted it to be touchscreen capable, which if you write it in Windows, it's XY coordinates, it's mouse movements, it's, it's done, no problem. He wanted it to be so you didn't have to have any third party implements, you didn't have to sit across the street with a keyboard, you didn't have to bring something in, a little chip and insert it in the computer, nothing. He wanted so you could go to the screen, hit some hidden buttons, and flip the vote and decide who the winner is just by doing that. Who did you say you were asked to prepare? I was asked by Tom Feeney. He's now a congressman. At that time, he was uh, Speaker of the House of Florida. And he asked you to design a, to see, to design a code to rig an election? Yes while he was Speaker of the Florida House? Yes. He wanted the source code so that you, when the manipulation happened, you couldn't see it even if you saw the source code. This is to control the vote in South Florida. So I told Rena, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You know, that'll get you in trouble. And so, you know, with the bulk of finding out how dishonest Feeney and this company was, it was time for me to leave. So I quit and moved on. I've been told that people who assume that a large fraction of the election result may have been affected by uh, deliberate fraud in the computer are, are paranoid because the, in order to do that, you have to have access to thousands of machines. To what extent is that true? It depends on the technology you use. If you did a central tabulation machine that fed in, all you'd have to do is set a flag. So one person putting in bad code in a central tabulation machine could affect thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of votes. Right. And your testimony is under oath. Yes, sir. And the testimony you've given is true. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Soon after he testified, Clint Curtis passed a lie detector test administered by the retired chief polygraph operator for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. If software to manipulate an election can be developed, has anyone proven that it can be installed and actually used on voting equipment? There's new evidence tonight that computer hackers could change election results without anyone knowing about it. The supervisor of election in Tallahassee tested voting machines several times over the last several months. Just Monday, his workers were able to hack into a voting machine and change the outcome. The election protection group blackboxvoting.org worked with voting official Ion Sancho to conduct an experiment on the security of voting machines. We did discover a potential security problem that exists which had not been disclosed by the vendor. The big controversy revolves around this little black computer card, smaller than a floppy disk, bigger than a flash drive. The card is inserted into voting machines which scan paper ballots. When Leon County's supervisor of elections tested the Diebold system and allowed experts to manipulate the card electronically, he could change the outcome of a mock election without leaving any kind of trail. Our tests also showed that if you audited or counted the paper ballots against the electronic totals, you could catch this vulnerability 100 times out of 100 times. I've worked with a supervisor on a number of things, and, and I think the biggest battle was over uh, the fact that he was being punished for having had his machines tested. The vendors were trying to deprive him of ADA-compliant machines for his voters with disabilities as a way of punishing him for having the nerve to have his machines tested. The security tests that I did upset the voting machine vendors I believe it's because for the first time a curtain had been pulled away and someone on my side of the line, an election official, had actually had the temerity to investigate the equipment which Leon County owned without actually having the vendor there to affect the tests. People across Florida let their voices be heard and demanded that there be an antitrust investigation into why the vendors were denying Ion Sancho machines. It was that investigation which the public demanded that really helped our legal case. We won that battle. In 2006, scientists from Princeton University replicated Ion Sancho's findings. They proved that it is possible for one person to insert fraudulent software on many Diebold machines with a single installation. But how technologically savvy do you have to be to be a hacker to do this? I mean... You have to be able to write computer programs. Yep. Uh, which a lot of people can do. Sure. Uh, you need to be able to open up this door on the side, which anybody, with, yeah. anybody can do. And anybody uh, that's about it. Let's see how it works. In advance, we prepare a memory card containing our malicious software. When we get a few minutes alone with the machine, we first open the side door. We remove any memory card that is already in the machine and insert our prepared memory card. We press the power button to boot the machine. We remove our memory card, replace any card that was there before, and close the door. Our malicious code is now installed on the machine. The total elapsed time is less than one minute. The computer virus went and switched the votes inside the computer's uh -huh. memory. Right. And when you see this result, what you see... Goodness. Hackers would have had to have done this before people voted. They would have had to have infected it with a virus, wow. and then it skews the before results. Before Election Day? Oh, yep. my goodness. Right. Anytime before Election Day. Security is so slack in the Diebold operation that when they printed a copy of their keys on their website, and it was on their website, scientists actually made copies of that key and that one key will open every Diebold voting machine in the United States of America. If a company like Diebold or ES&S came into American Express or one of the companies where I've worked and presented their software and they said, 
We're not going to give you an independent audit mechanism. We have security mechanisms in our software, trust us, but they're so good, you can't see them. They're trade secrets. If they were so foolish as to present that in any bank or brokerage house in America, we'd laugh them out of the room. Not only that, we'd pick up the phone and call the FBI. When is a glitch not a glitch? When are these uh, malfunctions not malfunctions at all? We can't just think we voted and hope we voted. We have to know we voted. And under present circumstances, most people have no clue as to whether they voted or not. It's little known that the Department of Homeland Security issued a security bulletin saying that a known vulnerability existed in this software. Were elections run in 2004 on equipment that was known by the Homeland Security to be vulnerable? Yes, they were. There are more than 20 voting machine companies in the United States, often with overlapping ownership, financing, staff, and equipment. Two of these companies electronically tally about 80% of the votes in our elections. ESNS, Diebold, they design, program, service, repair, maintain, and have virtually exclusive proprietary control of the machines that count our votes. Private companies have to take their software to other private companies and pay them for reports which tell them that their equipment works fine. And if they write reports which do not indicate the equipment is fine, they don't get the company's business. So this kind of, this privatized process that we have supposedly set up to protect America's voters' votes, in my opinion, is a sham. Unfortunately, the U.S. government has taken a completely hands-off approach uh, to, to this uh, issue. And you have voting machine companies who are out f just avidly and, and aggressively lobbying every public official who has anything to do with the process to get them to buy these machines. When I came on board as the director of the Board of Elections, a representative of Diebold Corporation came here to my office in the course of the conversation. Uh, he pulled out his checkbook and said, you know, I'm here to write you a $10,000 check. Who do you want me to make it payable to? And I said, well, you're certainly not going to make the check payable to me. If you want to make a contribution to the county Republican Party, I'm sure they'd be grateful. In addition to allegations that Diebold vendors offered gifts to election officials, reports also surfaced that some had direct ties to political parties. Before the 2004 presidential election, Walden O'Dell, CEO of Diebold, announced that he had been a top fundraiser for George W. Bush. In a letter to potential donors, O'Dell wrote, I am committed to helping Ohio deliver its electoral votes to the president. Reports of voting difficulties have been increasing over the last decade. We now know that voter suppression and irregular tallies reported widely in 2004 were not unique to that election. Reviewing the last decade, we can begin to see if there are patterns. The first major election in which a voting machine company appeared to influence the outcome was in Nebraska. In 1996, Chuck Hagel ran for U.S. Senate, and although his opponent, Ben Nelson, the incumbent governor, was ahead in the polls and was expected to make an easy win, Hagel won the election. The final pre-election polls were off by 14 percent. It was later learned that the winning candidate, Chuck Hagel, had failed to disclose that he was the former chairman and still part owner of the company that counted the votes and put him in office. The first well-publicized exit poll discrepancy in a U.S. presidential race was in Florida in 2000. 
On the morning of November 7th, I contacted a friend of mine who was a professional political consultant, and I said, what are the tracking polls telling you today? Because I know you have it. I know you have these numbers. And he said, the numbers indicate that Gore will win the election between somewhere between 30 and 80,000 votes in Florida. Early in the evening, the networks confidently predicted that Gore would take Florida after exit polls showed him ahead by 7%. A big call to make, CNN announces that we call Florida in the Al Gore column. That prediction turned out to be premature. Our earlier declaration of Florida, back to the too close to call column. Vote totals continued to fluctuate throughout the night. There were so many flip-flops election night 2000, when network heads were questioned about it during hearings, one congressman called it a monumental screw-up. Activists across the country launched challenges, stating that thousands of Florida voters had been blocked from voting, that their names were illegally removed from the lists, or that their votes simply hadn't been counted. Ion Sancho's jurisdiction, Leon County, had among the lowest error rates in the country. Based on that success, the Florida Supreme Court put Ion Sancho in charge of the Florida recount. I really thought that the whole process was about counting all of Florida's legal votes. That's what I thought. On December 12th, 2000, the Supreme Court stopped the recount in Florida and ended the debate. In a five to four, one time only decision that the court stressed would not set legal precedent, the court determined who would be president. The ballots from Miami Dade and Palm Beach, which were stored in my office in the safe, would never be counted. And when I went home, that's what I felt. America had been betrayed. For the first time in the history of this republic, a state was prevented from completing its own election. The only complete count of Florida's votes was done in 2001 by the media consortium. Their findings indicated that if Florida's manual recount law had been followed, Al Gore would have won the election. The presidential election of 2000 marked a watershed in United States history. The chaos, the spoiled ballots, the uncertainty, and a deeply divided Supreme Court. The result was a clear loss of public trust in elections. In response, Congress introduced new legislation, upgrading all election procedures, especially voting technology. As a result, millions of voters would be using electronic voting equipment for the first time. In the 2002 midterm elections, Georgia was one of the first states to use only electronic voting machines statewide in an election. Chris Hood was an election consultant who had worked for Diebold, now known as Premier Election Solutions. In 2002, he was on the ground in Georgia, helping Diebold prepare for the midterm election. The Secretary of State signed an agreement and gave Diebold the authority to run the entire election, top to bottom. So that meant we're going to bring our own people in and basically create the ballots, run the election, tabulate the votes for the state of Georgia. The state had established a test procedure, which was a list of required tests by state law. So during this deployment, when we saw a lot of machines failing, we weren't following the exact procedure called for by the state. So with so many failures and so much confusion and so much unskilled staff, this was a very disorganized operation. The votes cast on Diebold machines were stored in unprotected memory cards, which could easily be altered. These memory cards not only carry vote data, they also carry computer programs and software updates or patches. As one of his responsibilities, Chris Hood 
was asked to place a software patch on the machines to be used in certain Georgia counties before the election. I'd receive a call from uh, one of the project managers at Debold to be at this warehouse, which was in this case DeKalb County, and uh, references were also made to Fulton County. Fulton and DeKalb counties are home to more than half of the Democratic voters in Georgia. After we got into the warehouse, Bob Urosevich, the president of Debold, arrived with a stack of these memory cards and announced that we needed to patch the machine because the clock wasn't working properly. So he said, this will fix that situation, and we also needed to patch every machine in the state. One closely watched Georgia race in 2002 was the Senate contest between Max Cleland and Saxby Chambliss. In the final pre-election polls, incumbent Democratic Senator Max Cleland led his Republican challenger, Saxby Chambliss, by five points. And most people were expecting that he would be reelected. We're only a few weeks away from an election, and we're going to patch every machine. This operation took all day, but after this event, I never heard another word about a patch. I never heard about any other counties being patched. It was also said that the state was not to know about this. When the actual votes were tallied, it was Saxby Chambliss winning over Cleveland by seven points. That's a unexpected 12-point shift in a state that for the first time had deployed across the state Diebold touchscreen electronic voting equipment. In Alabama in 2002, initial returns showed Governor Don Siegelman winning re-election. However, before his win could be certified, officials in Baldwin County claimed that because of a computer glitch, votes there needed to be recounted. After the polls had closed, after midnight, when the poll workers, the Democratic poll workers and the Republican poll workers and representatives of the media had gone home, the election officials, all of whom are Republicans, got together and recounted the votes. Uh, in that process, I lost some 6,000 votes, enough to swing the election from me to my Republican opponent. It didn't affect a single other race. Not one other vote changed that night. Between the 2002 midterm and the presidential election of 2004, the use of electronic voting machines continued to expand. While it is impossible to independently verify accurate electronic vote tallies after an election is complete, it is still possible to compare the number of votes cast with those that are counted. According to the U.S. Census Survey, in the 2004 election, there were 125.7 million votes cast. Of those, only 122.3 million were actually counted, which left more than 3 million votes uncounted. An independent investigation documented three categories of uncounted votes in 2004. Spoiled ballots, provisional ballots, and absentee ballots. This independent finding of more than three million uncounted votes confirmed the accuracy of the census survey. In addition to votes that were never counted, Across the country, tallies appeared showing more votes than voters. At one of Representative John Conyers' meetings to gather testimonies, a citizen explains his frustration with trying to report 96 overvotes in his precinct in Perry County, Ohio. On or about November the 9th, I filed a report. After that, I was actually in contact with the FBI agents. I provided them with data. Did I do the wrong thing by contacting the FBI and providing them with evidence? <laughs> I, what did you, I'm what did I am not one of these conspiracy theorists. I am a patriotic and I love my country. They are a federal law enforcement agency. I want you to know that we received your letter and that we included it in our 34 
questions to Secretary of State Blackwell, to which he has replied to none of them. Kenneth Blackwell, former Ohio Director of Elections, who also served as honorary co-chairman of Bush's 2004 re-election campaign, defended himself on television. One of the criticisms regarding the campaign and the election in Ohio, though, was directed at you personally, that as the state's top election official, it is the appearance of a conflict of interest for you to have also been the honorary co-chairman of the Bush-Cheney re-election campaign. As Reverend Jackson put it, Mr. Blackwell cannot be both the owner of the team and the umpire. Should those two jobs not be mixed? But let me tell you, I, I just told you, Keith, we have a, a bipartisan system in Ohio, free of fraud, free of intimidation, and that's what we delivered on Election Day, and we're very, very proud of it, and we, are, we have met every test. At least 70 percent of Ohio uses punch card ballots, but the state has used those kind of ballots for years, never had any problem, but this year, who knows? In some Ohio locations, especially minority communities, punch card errors did not seem to be random. In Cuyahoga County, third party candidates got a high percentage of the votes. In Precinct 4F, an ultra conservative minor party candidate received almost as many votes as John Kerry. How could this have happened? Sometimes several precincts voted in one location. When candidates' names appeared in different ballot orders for each precinct, there was a risk that votes cast on the wrong machine, which they sometimes are, might be misread. There is evidence that that error significantly affected some final counts. Some voters were prevented from voting after election officials selectively removed their names from the rolls. In Ohio, which President Bush won by 118,000 votes, according to the official tally, there were 300,000, almost all Democratic voters, who were purged from the rolls immediately before the election. George Bush's margin of victory in Ohio was almost 119,000 votes. As long as we refuse to deal with the reality, we won't move forward. I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to get over it. I mean, that's what they tell you. Well, just get over it. You know, again, what I always say, what, what am I supposed to get over? Fundamental human rights, my commitment to democracy, my love of the Constitution and the country. I'm supposed to turn a blind eye when American citizens are disenfranchised because of the color of their skin? Uh, I don't think so. The tactic known as caging involves two steps. First, registered letters are mailed to the homes of potential voters. Then the names of those who don't reply are deleted from the voter rolls. The Republican campaign staff mistakenly released data on the internet which was discovered and then forwarded to BBC journalist Greg Pallast. We got in our computers from the Republican National Committee spreadsheets. These spreadsheets were addresses and names of tens of thousands of voters. The BBC confronted the Republican leadership and they said, oh, these are um, donor lists. This was a challenge list a list for challenging voters en masse by the hundreds of thousands. And I'm finding page after page after page of African-American soldiers. So the soldiers were shipped overseas. They got a letter from the Republican Party. It was not forwarded. So the Republicans said their address is suspect. You had thousands of African-American soldiers whose votes were subject to Republican Party challenge because they were shipped overseas. And by the way, it's not illegal in the United States of America for a soldier to vote from Baghdad from their home district. Now, why wouldn't they fess up to this? Since 1965, the Voting Rights Act targeting voters for a challenge, even if you have some grounds for it, but where race is a factor, is a, is a felony. 
there's just too many little incidents that if you don't add them up, remain little incidents scattered like marbles. And um, it, it takes some special effort to start adding them up and say, this is a big story here. Given the problems in 2000, 2002, and 2004, voters approached the midterm elections of 2006 with increased caution. And of course, Wolf, we've talked a lot about the more than 850 monitors and observers who were on hand today in 22 states sent by the Department of Justice, and they're there to deal with issues as they arise. Voting glitches have been popping up at some polling stations across the country this election day. It's the same problem. It's that they try to start the machines up in the morning and something goes wrong. The biggest question tonight is whether or not your vote will actually count. Election officials all across the country have been reporting problems with e-voting machines. Data analysts have noted the correlation between the rise of electronic voting devices and elections in which exit polls don't match final tallies. In 2006, there were, once again, a range of computer malfunctions and discrepancies between votes cast and official totals. At first, exit polls showed Democratic House candidates winning by 11.5%. After the exit poll was adjusted by Edison Mitofsky to match the vote totals, the final results showed Democrats winning by only 7.6%. This discrepancy reflects at least three million fewer votes for Democratic candidates than exit polls predicted. Until 2002, the national exit poll margin of error had always been plus or minus 1.3%. With mounting discrepancies between exit polls and the official vote count after the 2006 election, Pollsters chose to increase the official margin of error from 1.3 to 3%. Either exit polls are becoming harder and harder to do, or voting manipulation is becoming easier and easier to do. There have been a wide range of election irregularities in the years since 1996. Have any laws actually been broken? Welcome back, my guest tonight, former Republican operative who served time in federal prison for his role in the 2002 New Hampshire phone jamming operation. He writes about the experience in his book, How to Rig an Election, Confessions of a Republican Operative. Please welcome to the show, Alan Raymond, sir. <laughs> What is the phone jamming scandal of 2002? Well, that was when I got hired by the Republican National Committee to jam phone lines. It sound, it's exactly what it sounds like. We called in. It's almost, it almost was like a prank. Democrats in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. A prank on democracy. <laughs> <laughs> what we did is we called into uh, where the Democrats were doing GOTV, and we tied up the phone lines. So nothing could go in or could go out on Election Day. And anything you do on Election Day is to get out the vote. How do you convince yourself that this isn't voter suppression? Well, um, you talk to an attorney, which is exactly what I did. <laughs> and so in politics, there's right and wrong, and then there's what happens in a campaign. Allegations of wrongdoing in the 2004 presidential election were widespread, especially in Ohio. Has anyone been held accountable? Franklin County Board of Election Deputy Director, Democrat Michael Hackett, was convicted on charges of profiting from a voting machine contract. Hackett's punishment was a year of probation, $3,250 in fines, and 45 hours of community service. His superior, Matt Damschroeder, was also convicted of illegal actions. His penalty? He was censured and suspended from work for a month. In Cuyahoga County, Ohio, two election workers were convicted for pre-selecting ballots 
to avoid discrepancies when the votes were retallied. Before the end of the year in 2007, 56 of Ohio's 88 counties reported that they had destroyed most of their ballots and other records from the 2004 presidential election. This action was taken despite Ohio election law and in violation of a federal court order to retain them. Without those ballot records, the accuracy of the Ohio vote reported on election night 2004 will never be known. Even though various investigations have been carried out, there have been few convictions. If you look at the pattern, behavioral pattern of embezzlers, when they have a successful scam or a successful hack, they don't go whole hog at first. They tend to be very, very careful to make sure they're not caught. And the longer that they go without being detected, the more that they try and the more that they get away with. People can't uh, conceive of uh, a party or a sitting government uh, stealing an election. You know, this is not something their government would do. And, uh, you know, some, some corrupt local government might uh, steal a local election, but nationally, uh, to see uh, a government organized to steal an election is beyond uh, comprehension. But you see, it is not beyond the comprehension for an ideologically motivated government. And if you're an ideological government, the only thing important is, is uh, your ends. Your ends justify any means. Indeed, your ends require you to steal the election. If you need to steal the election to stay in power to achieve your ends. There are people from every background, every socioeconomic group, every race, every everything in this country that knows something very bad happened and knows it impacts themselves and their family and they want their country back. We have to be sharper in our pursuit of the truth precisely because it's being so cleverly hidden from view. And pursuit of the truth in this case might mean paper ballots, things that can actually be counted. Paper? What, what like parchment or papyrus? E-technology is foolproof. The only people who can mess with your e-vote are the computer programmers who design the system. It takes a long time to change 10,000 paper ballots by hand. It takes three seconds to change 10,000 votes on a computer. Uh, I think the most appropriate technology is, is what we should be going for instead of the latest and greatest. If you can just talk to another person or another citizen, you say, look, these are the issues. How do you want your elections conducted? It's a no-brainer. I mean, people are thoroughly on the side of this. They say, yeah, let's have ballots. Let's have paper ballots. So in New Mexico, when we realized we had to get legislative action accomplished. It just seemed like, oh boy, how are we ever gonna do this? But we tapped into all the activists across the state, each one with their own particular skills or talents, as overwhelming as it was to imagine trying to change our electoral system or to shift from corporate back into the hands of the people, our vote. Uh, it seems so overwhelming. But one of the women in the group said, why don't you get on the internet, post something somewhere, and find out if there's any other groups in New Mexico who are working on that. It was such a simple idea. And so I posted a piece on there, and I said, here we are in Las Vegas. Is there anybody else out there? I bet you it was a day that I got an email that said, we're working on that here down in Los Alamos County. Oh, I knew, that's it. This is all it's going to take, two groups in different parts of the state hooking up, and then it'll just spread. Some of us went and testified at the legislature and said, here's our concerns, and they listened. And the pressure from various voting rights groups and individuals on the governor's office caused the governor of New Mexico to sit down and actually take a look at this. And so he proposed this legislation, 
and the New Mexico legislature passed it. And so now we have paper ballots and optical scan technology in New Mexico. Citizens are now working to pass legislation to strengthen the audit process for those machines. At the same time, some grassroots activists are laying the groundwork for hand counting the paper ballots. So when I was overwhelmed, I was overwhelmed because I was thinking I would have to do it by myself. But when you unite across the state, you can get a lot accomplished. How we got this done in New Mexico needs to happen all over the country. And once we get that in place, we will finally get our vote count back in the hands of the people. We need to ensure that all citizens who are eligible to vote are able to vote, and that all votes cast are accurately counted. Until we as citizens decide that the most fundamental aspect of democracy is free and fair elections, everything we believe in, everything that guarantees our right to earn a living and protect our children, everything our fathers and forefathers died for, is being slowly and invisibly taken from us. It's time to wake up. What you stand to lose is everything. You can raise your concerns with a neighbor, with a friend. Maybe they've thought of it, maybe they haven't. One linking to one linking to one is how you make a necklace, how you make a relationship, how you make a network, how you make a movement. And if this film does anything, it will make you take yourself and your vote and your country seriously enough to get engaged and go to work. And together, we'll take our country back.